So just to sort of kick off who I am, the work I'm presenting is joint with uh, Nancy Rothbard, who's a social psychologist, with, social psychologist with me at the University of Pennsylvania at the Wharton School, where we both are. Um, I'm an economic sociologist, so we're both social scientists coming through different ways. And I've been interested and involved in the game industry for a long time. Um, I've written a book that was, uh, I forgot, I didn't get to coin the term gamification because it came out in 2008, but I was close. Uh, and so I wrote a book on games and business. I've designed games for everyone from the military to teaching financial literacy to the poor. Uh, I've designed a game simulation to teach entrepreneurship. I'm an entrepreneurship and innovation professor. So this is an area I know deeply and, and quite well and have followed for a very long time. Uh, and what has motivated me in this field is that I think where we stand at this point is that we have a large amount of kind of case studies, enthusiasm, interest, and a history behind gamification, but remarkably little in the way of actual rigorous outcomes in terms of understanding what makes gamification work, when it doesn't work, and what we have to worry about. And that's what I want to try and bring to the table a bit today. And I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of a history of, of um, gamification research, because it actually goes back farther than you think. Uh, and those concepts are important because they're going to matter when we talk about some of the studies I'll show you, which include controlled field studies about the impact of gamification and some of the downsides as well as upsides. Um, and I'll try to leave some time for questions at the end. We have a fairly short time slot, so if I don't, I'm happy to talk to anyone about this later on as well. So uh, let's get to the evidence. And I, I want to first show you, this is an aerial picture of probably the single most important geographic location in the history of gamification. Uh, and I'm sure none of you know what this one is. This is the uh, Harvey uh, Chicago Engine Works, uh, which might surprise you that the Harvey Chicago Engine Works is a, is a key site in gamification, but it is because social scientists have been studying games at business for years. Uh, Ross Smith is here somewhere, and as he pointed out, there's evidence that uh, as early back as uh, the time of the pyra pyramids being built, people were using games to motivate work performance. And this is nothing new. People have studied this for a while. But uh, until Harvey, people thought of games as a problem to be solved. Games were always shirking. If somebody was playing a game at work, it meant they were taking money away from you because they weren't doing their job. And that was the way games were viewed for a very long time. It was the way maybe people would blow off steam, but it was something that you wanted to avoid having happen. Okay? Uh, and then, but then uh, along came two sociologists who went to uh, 20 years apart in the 1950s and 1970s to study at the, uh, to actually work as ethnographers on the ground at the Harvey Engine Works. And they were coincidentally in the same plant. Uh, the first guy was named Roy, the second guy, Burroy. And they changed the way that academics thought about games at work. Uh, and this is my favorite slide I've ever created. Uh, Mark's at a banana, and it actually makes sense, as I'll explain in a second. Um, so, uh, Roy, uh, a sociologist who went into the field, realized that uh, he, was, he was actually at working at the company. So he decided to take a job there and experience work. And what he realized is that work was so boring and so mind-numbing and so uninteresting that everyone at work made up games to just pass the time, to give them a sense of enthusiasm, to give them a sense of accomplishment. Uh, the game he described in detail was called Banana Time, which involved the workers stealing bananas from each other's lunch. It was not that exciting, but it was a lot more exciting than st stamping parts in a machine plant over and over again. And that started people thinking about, well, maybe work is actually doing something, uh, work and games are doing, have a relationship that we don't quite fully understand. So along came Burroway, uh, who was a critical theorist, essentially a Marxist, uh, and he came to look at games from the perspective of why hasn't there been a class revolution? So he thought, okay, you know, the work is boring, work is, is difficult, there's conflicts between managers and workers, why are workers not agitating for better positions? So he went to the Harvey machine plant and he started working there. And he got caught up in the games people played at the plant. And so caught up in the games and competing with other people that he thought, huh, maybe what's actually happening here is as people play games at work, they are doing the kind of tasks the managers want them to do, but their competition is with each other rather than with management. So he raised this idea that maybe what happens in gamification is people are agreeing to work thr through the process of the game. As they play the game, the game is about work. That gets them to agree to doing work in general. And something, some sort of virtuous cycle is happening here. Right? So since these guys have done their work, games have been observed by academics in, uh, in luxury hotels, in casinos, among truckers, uh, obviously here. Right? So there's been game, games seem to be fairly ubiquitous. Now, what set all of these initial games that people have played for thousands of years at work apart from the kind of games that we talk about is all of those games were organic. They were bottom up, right? So these were games created for workers, by workers, for each other, right? So they, 
you created them at work because work was boring, uh, work was dull. In my favorite phrase ever, the goal of games was to slay, to slay the beast of monotony, right? So you created these games in order so you wouldn't feel bogged down in this meaningless job where all you got was money and no satisfaction. So workers created those games and shared them with each other, and the games that were good succeeded. Now, what's happened in gamification that's interesting is we've taken this and flipped on its head. Rather than having these, these ideas bubble up from the bottom, we're imposing them from the top. We're saying, okay, let's go in and create a game that'll be compelling and interesting and fun. And what happens when we start to do that? And that's sort of an unknown question. It's not the same thing as these worker-created games. So that's what we set it to find. And we thought about this in some detail, and we, we came up with something that is not true just in games, but it's true in things like company parties, company pub crawls, all sorts of events where you impose a uh, fun activity when it's fun when it's done by the workers on workers from above. Uh, we call it the paradox of mandatory fun, right? You are imposing a fun activity on people. So how are people gonna react to that, right? Well, it turns out that if you go back to these early game researchers, they had this concept called consent. The idea was that by playing a game, it built consent for the kind of work you were doing because you were playing the game and by the act of playing the game, you were agreeing to the kind of work conditions you were involved in. That's fine when a game comes from the bottom up organically, but that doesn't necessarily happen when it's imposed from the top down, right? So one of the big changes in gamification, and I don't care whether you're talking about formal games, which we'll talk about here, I'll show you actual games like basketball games, that's what I'm gonna give you examples from, or any employee reward system that's supposed to be fun or make work more meaningful, when you're posing it from the top, you're running into this par possible paradox of mandatory fun, and you need to think about, are the workers consenting to this sort of activity? So we wanted to dig into this with actual numbers and get a sense of what happens with games and consent. So we went to a fast-growing, just at that time, pre-IPO uh, social e-commerce company. Uh, and uh, it was, we took, they, they agreed to work with us. We worked with a company called Hoopla, which does gamification solutions for Salesforce uh, to sort of build the system here. And we took their three sales floors. They had three big floors of this organization. We took one of them and uh, we left it as a control group. We took one of them and turned their work into a game in a way I'll explain. And one we used just leaderboards, right? And we looked at the issu at issues of consent. Did people understand the game? Did they follow it closely? Did they understand the rules? Did they think it was fair? These turned out to be critical factors. We'll talk about them more in a second. So three conditions, right? The, the game condition was a basketball themed game, big monitors all over the sales f uh, floor. It was fired off their Salesforce system, so when someone made a sale, uh, it would, they would score points. So if they closed a warm lead, it would be a layup. If they closed a closed call, it would be a, a, a cold call, it would be a jump shot. We had display screens everywhere sort of showing all this detail. Emails were sent out to participants. Uh, and I should mention, this is a really excited workforce already. This company was about to IPO. The sales team was very young and engaged, so we already had a very high engagement level. Uh, and we were sort of adding to that here. The control condition, we just left as is. And then we had this alternative control condition where we put leaderboards up, right? So same thing without the game theme or graphics, okay? And then what we did was observe for three weeks, we let the game run uh, and looked at the changes in performance and not just performance, but other factors over the course of the game. And here's what happened. So uh, if you can't read it, we looked at three different kinds of outcomes. One thing we looked at was performance. Did you, get, did you do better or worse in sales? The second thing we looked at was affect. It's hard to necessarily move the needle on performance in a lot of ways. There's a lot going on in this company. Again, people were getting compensation. We were not compensating them for this. This game was on top of everything else they were doing. Um, so affect is positive feeling towards work. It's a contagious feeling. There can be positive or negative affect. It's very important. Uh, it's sort of the enthusiasm that people bring to work, and there seems to be pretty strong connections between high levels of affect, positive affect, and success in creative and sales sorts of jobs. So if people have high, kind of high positive energy, it spreads to the rest of the organization. That can be very powerful. So we measured that, and then we me measured attitude towards the company, right? We wanted to see if this changed attitudes towards teams or companies. And we did a whole bunch of other things that I'm happy to talk to you guys about later if you want, like intrinsic motivation. Turns out this actually doesn't link very well to intrinsic motivation at all. So what we, what we got as effect from the game turned out not to be linked at all to the intrinsic side. So here's what happened. We found um, that on the performance side, and we, we, we took this leaderboard group, and this is relative to the control group, okay? So we have a leaderboard. We have the game where people consented. That means they thought the game was fair. They understood the rules. They paid attention to it. And then people where they didn't consent, where they didn't pay as much attention, they didn't understand the rules, and, uh, they, and they didn't think the game was fair, right? So we divided it that way. 
And what we found was, on the performance side, we didn't find a strong effect from, from performance on the game with consent, but we found borderline negative effects from both the leaderboard and the game without consent. And that matches other literature that shows that leaderboards can be pretty problematic unless they're executed properly. Uh, and by borderline, I mean on the edge of statistical significance, but not highly significant, right? The next thing we looked at was affect. Again, this attitude towards work. And this was over a period of time. Uh, and we found a very strong positive effect for the game with consent, even in this really excited workforce where people were really enthused to go into work every day. When we asked them on a scale of one to five what their affect level was, it was always like four. I mean, which is incredibly high for any organization, right? Especially a telesales organization. But we were able to move the needle significantly uh, by uh, with the game with consent. The game without consent dropped affect. So people actually had a big de de decrease in their positive feelings towards work. Uh, and we also found a strong positive increase in attitudes towards the company for the game with consent, right? So a pattern's emerging here, right? And it's across a variety of different statistical tests in a controlled experiment that having consent matters a lot. And if you don't have that, that element of consent, a game can actually be harmful. Now, this is also positive results, by the way, that games can work. I mean, the, people spend a lot of money trying to figure out how to move affect, how to try and move uh, cohesion within a company. And we were able to get those effects even in this organization. So there's a positive side, but there's a dark side too which should raise the issue in your head, what leads to consent, right? Well, we found a couple things in this study. Um, the first is winning and losing didn't matter that much. So if you, if you looked at the effect of points on whether or not you consented to the game, it uh, didn't seem to have a large effect. What did have a big effect was how many hours of multiplayer games you played outside of work, right? So if you were already a gamer, so unsurprisingly, you came into work feeling very enthusiastic about games. Right? I think that's a general warning, by the way. I'm, I'm enthusiastic about games. I've got a Razer PC here, right? I'm, I'm into this. But uh, people who are enthusiastic about games often think everybody else likes them. Not always the case here, right? And that was strongly indicated. But that doesn't help you that much if you're actually interested in implementing gamification. Because what it tells you is, I should hire gamers if I want to do this. And I, as much as I'd like to change your HR policy, I, I don't think that that's necessarily the right way to go. So we thought about what other levers could you pull to make games more effective. So we ended up running a second experiment. Uh, with the help of a game company called Gizmocracy, we created three versions of the same basic Q game. So there were a bunch of shapes. Each shape had a timer next to it. You'd push a button, and after a period of time, it would eliminate the shapes in the queue uh, that were associated with that, that button, right? So I'd hit the circle, and then after a second, all the circles would disappear. If I waited too long and a timer ran out, that shape would escape and I'd lose points. So we took this game, exact same gameplay, exact same pattern, and we created three versions of it. So that version, and then we created a, uh, a fantasy game, like a way over the top fantasy game uh, theme with uh, orcs and the mountains of murder and blood axe and all every, basically every bit of bad fantasy right I could shove into this I did. Uh, in this case, you were attacking, you were casting spells against various kinds of creatures, and when you succeeded, they'd explode in showers of blood. I mean, we, we went all out on this, right? Uh, you heard battle horns and so on. And then we did another version, which was a magic happy village. And you were a farmer, and you were trying to grow plants to make people in the village happy. So you'd have to grow cat for, catnip for the cat. You'd have to grow flowers uh, for, you know, for the, uh, the person looking for a wife or a husband. It was the same exact set of things, different theme, right? Uh, and so the idea here was to pick kind of polar opposites. And then we went to, a psych uh, we went to the psych lab at, at Penn, and uh, we presented people with three different kinds of options. Some people were given no choice about what game to play. They were just randomized into a game condition, right? Whether they played the game or not. Some people were given a choice, play Wizards versus Orcs or Farmer's Market, and whatever choice they got, whatever choice they made, that's what they got. And some people got the opposite, right? So we got their preference, and then we gave them the opposite of what they wanted, right? And the idea here was to see, okay, what happens if we give people agency or control? It turned out this made a big difference. Uh, the consent, the, those consent factors, did people understand the rules of the game? Did they pay attention? think it was fair. Remember, all of these games were identical in every way except for the theming and except for the choice that people had. If you had a choice, you had, the high, you had very high levels of consent, right? If you were given your choice. Didn't matter which one it was, right? It, in the end, it collapsed. There was slightly, there was even gender disappeared as a factor once you sort of took this all into account. Um, for those that were not presented with a choice, they generally had fairly high levels of consent, uh, reasonably high levels of consent, uh, but less high than the group that had a choice. And for the groups that got the opposite of what they wanted, very negative impacts on consent, right? So a very strong kind of direct effect here, which is if you give people a sense of agency or control, you get that consent that makes a game work. 
If you take away that sense of agency or control or impose a solution on people, even when they don't want it, you get uh, the negative impacts, right? It's a very direct kind of effect here. So what does that mean? First of all, we have here a controlled study that shows that gamification can actually have a big impact, right? Which I think is important. I mean, I love the case studies. I've written, you know, as I said, a book on gamification. I've written chapters on gamification. And I, I populate almost all of those things with case studies that are the same ones I've heard many times, right? About the, the companies that have been successful or report some high level results, but I never get to see the data, right? So I'm always worried when I see a case study that, that there's, yeah, who knows what's there, who knows what's being measured. Right. In this case, we actually have data, and the data shows that gamification, with consent, can have a big positive effect on people's attitude towards work, even in an excited and engaged environment. But there's a double-edged sword here. Gamification without consent can actually go ahead and lower both performance and attitude. Right? Uh, and the fairly strongly, again, in a very exciting environment where people were being incentivized all other kinds of ways. On the day we were there setting up the game, Outside of this game, they had a sales incentive that involved a giant box full of cash and a huge fan, and anyone who closed a sale got to walk into the box and grab as much cash from the air as they could, right? So the fact that we were able to get any movement out of gamification in an environment where you had big boxes of cash going on shows you there's something else going on here besides just pure incentives that's very powerful, right? So something real is here. Now, the worry I have is that some of these factors of gamification, the importance of consent, tends to get overlooked because uh, in voluntary settings, which are most of the examples of gamification we have, marketing and similar cases, then what you'll see is high levels of engagement from the people who are engaging in gamification, because those are the people who like games, right? If you don't like gamification or whatever incentive scheme you have, right, it doesn't have to be playing actual games, it could just be a reward or point system, then if you like that, you'll be high, more highly engaged. But what happens is you're often missing the fact that lots of people are dropping out because they're uninterested in whatever the system you built is. When you bring this inside organizations, people no longer have the option, right? And that becomes problematic. The second thing is that a lot of the cases I look at, measurement is often pretty bad or non-existent. So you look at sort of one factor, but you don't consider the full set, right? So attitude plus out, uh, outcomes matter here, right? You're trying to look at the full set of things that you move. So there are pretty established ways of measuring these things. If you're just measuring one thing, you're gonna miss some of the negative, potential negative effects, and that could come turn around and bite you later on. And then, remember that gamification without consent is mandatory fun, right? And there's all this evidence. There's research on company parties that shows that company parties, when they're imposed on people, actually exacerbate divides within the company, ethnic divides and, uh, and group divides, because you're imposing on people that are uncomfortable, so they gather together in their groups. There's a lot of evidence that if you, if you impose a fun solution on people without taking their choice into account, you get these negative impacts. So how do you avoid the second edge? So, First of all, think about consent, right? That's the most critical factor that we have. And the best way to get consent is give people agency, give people a choice. That could be the version we had where people had a choice of themes. That could be a choice of whether or not to participate in the game at all, right? So you're only playing with people who are already enthusiastic about it. This can be a choice about uh, and having people work with you to design the game so that you have lots of group input into what's happening so people feel that they own it. Right? But that sense of control ends up being absolutely critical to avoiding the downsides of gamification and making sure that you get to benefit from, you get benefit from the upsides. The second thing that I measure is, you mentioned is measurement. Right? You have to measure what you want to change, but also what you want to avoid changing. Right? It's, it, we have a nice view of gamification as this wonderful thing, and I think it is, and I think we've just begun to scratch the surface. I mean, there's not a lot of academic studies out there uh, it, we're in the very early days, but these positive results are really encouraging. We usually don't get these sorts of things as early on as we do in these kind of controlled studies. So something really powerful is happening here that I'm personally very excited about. But we have to avoid the negative side too by measuring what we want to change and what we don't want to so we can learn from that and continue to evolve. Um, so I was told if I end now, I have a few minutes for questions, but um, please feel free to contact me, uh, especially if you are a company that is trying to do gamification, would like to have everything get measured uh, and find out results and is interested in experimentation. I'm very interested in talking to you. Uh, I have a Twitter account too. And if you want to read the paper with all the tables and uh, equations, uh, you can just go to SSRN uh, and, and search for mandatory fun and you'll be able to pull it down and read it. And if you have criticisms or comments, it's grinding through the very slow peer review process in the management journals. But uh, 
is, is being very well received there. So I'm, I'm excited to hear more. And as I said, I've been part of this community a long time. It's nice to stand up in front of you and be able to tell you some positive results, if, if also some warnings. So any questions I can answer? Yes. So I was just asked, what if there are two choices and you don't like either one? So we, we did measure that, right? How much you were happy with the choice, how much you liked games. It's on aggregate, having a choice and being given the choice makes you feel more committed to that choice and you get the agency effect. So that raises consent. So even if you're given a choice between two versions and you'd rather not play a game at all, it's still better than uh, imposing a solution. Any other questions? Yes. A little, little louder, please. Okay, so the worry is about a novelty effect that might wear off, right? We don't measure that here. We have, and we have a three-week cycle, and we didn't see a big time effect here. Now, that just could be because of the pacing of the game, right? Um, so we're not finding a novelty effect in terms of the sort of time decay. Doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, in terms of the advice I, I give with that, I mean, I, I think that it's part of a continuous cycle. I think if you're actually measuring what you do, learning from it and adapting, the game will stay fresh, right? The danger is that you don't adjust anything. So we, we, we spent a lot of time piloting this. We had a bunch of factors that were semi-random going in to make things better. Uh, but just because we didn't find it doesn't mean that there isn't a strong novelty effect here. Any other questions? Yes. Just really loud because... So in a highly regulated business, how can you use gamification? So I think one of the biggest sets of impacts that we have some good studies on is games for training and for retention. And those are things that usually work quite well in regulated markets, even if you're not willing to mess with the core revenue generating function, which is what they were willing to do here, right? They put their whole business under this gamification microscope to see what happened. But we, we have some fairly strong evidence already that games for training when built properly, games for recruitment, uh, and you know those things can still work. And then the other thing that I'm sure you've heard from other people, but if you want to use games in a voluntary setting, right, to avoid this consent problem, then that lines up really well with what we, th one of the reasons we know that it works well for gamification, which is encouraging people to take voluntary action and coordinate where they might not have otherwise. So instead of it being for your core business function, it becomes about building the wiki to help you know, provide an information service. It, it, it's about mentoring employees. Other kinds of things that are already voluntary activities, so you get the benefit of the activity already being voluntary and the game being voluntary, which increases consent. Good. Anything else? Uh, great. So thank you. Oh, so one last question. Yep. So what about consent in a training environment? So we have a study underway right now where we're looking at exactly that. Um, there does seem to be, anecdotally, I can't give you hard sort of p-value numbers at this point, we see a consent effect there. Uh, the danger is a little bit less because the engagement level for most training is pretty low anyway. So the people who get disengaged actually don't get that much more disengaged than they would in any case, and the people who get engaged get much more so. So there's a, there's a safety there in those kind of cases that gives you some room to, but again, if you ask people voluntarily to engage in this or give them choices about a gamified or non-gamified output, I mean, I think you'll, you'll find a strong effect there, right? And it becomes self-fulfilling because the community starts supporting itself and the people who play the games are the ones into it and they get other people into it and you build that consent up in a sort of virtuous cycle. So thank you guys very much. Um, I, 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 at the end of my time, but uh, feel free to come up and talk to me. And again, I'm, I think there's good news here uh, and I hope that uh, you'll continue to work with me and share some information with me as you move on it yourselves.